Hey, everybody. God bless you. I hope you're doing well through this whole coronavirus pandemic and how that's affecting your life, I'm sure, in many different ways. Today, I want to talk about captivity again. This might be the last time, I don't know, but being trained in adversity, that this is for a purpose. This is such a, a major lesson or principle in the kingdom of God. I'd like you to turn to John 12. We're going to look at verses 27 through 29, <clears throat> a passage that I've been fascinated with a long time, probably about 30 years. I read a book way back uh, entitled after this particular passage. You know, discipleship is really important. Discipleship is something that has been somewhat lost in the church, but is so essential because every person needs somebody that can speak into their lives. I'm not talking about someone to control you, make your decisions for you, what we might call a coach today, but disciple in the New Testament meant learner. <clears throat> every situation we go through, everything, every difficulty, every challenge, every pandemic that may come, it offers an opportunity, as I've mentioned in the past couple of weeks, for change. And so honestly, as believers, we've got to slow down and begin to look and listen where we are in order that we might learn and be trained in the midst of adversity. Some of the most advanced training <clears throat> will come to you during this time, if you look at it properly. You know, I was raised in a discipleship movement, really, uh, in my late teens and early 20s. I, I tied in with a group of guys from Washington, D.C., and they, uh, they just began to pour into my life. And I'm so thankful for it. I mean, there's parts of it I didn't like, and looking back, I'd probably do some things differently. But overall, my memory of that moment was, was foundation-setting, life-setting, because I chose to put myself in a relationship with some other guys so they could speak into my life, and they did. And I altered some of my uh, behavior at that point. So I was being trained. It's like anything that you get into. My son is into heating and air conditioning. He had to be trained. <clears throat> He's been there five years now, though, and he he flows. There's a function. There's an understanding. Why? Because he's a well-trained individual, therefore became a good employee. So look in John chapter 12. The background to this passage is that Jesus had just been anointed in Bethany. You remember where his feet were anointed with oil and washed by the hair of a uh, of a woman who just poured herself out to Jesus in that moment and then and then he had his triumphal entry so he's having he's having a beginning here of a week <clears throat> that is amazing but he knows he knows his focus is on a death he's been telling the disciples all along that I'm I'm going to die I'm going to be raised up 3 days later he's told them in parables he's told them outright not saying that they really understand what's going to happen yet but he's in that mode. He's in the mode of knowing I'm set. I don't know how you are, but, you know, if I know I've got to do something and it's something that is, that is going to, that is, that is valuable, that is strong, say, you know, performing a wedding or a funeral or preaching or something like that in my life, uh, it's hard for me to vacation the day before that. In fact, it took me decades to train myself to relax on Saturdays before Sunday. Because on Saturday, I'd just be thinking about my message. I'd had to, I had to train myself really to compartmentalize, put that aside, and really focus on what I was doing in the moment and to be present with them. So Jesus is in a moment where he's experiencing a lot of good things, but he knows what's about to come. And he reveals it right now in John chapter 12, what he's going through, this adversarial moment, this troubling moment, like kind of like many of you are experiencing Jesus had that. He was fully God, but fully man. I love the humanity of Christ. I love the incarnation of Christ. It makes me feel so much better about myself that he ate, that he fellowshiped, that he felt lonely at times, that he sought solitude, that he loved being with people, that he loved food. He loved all those aspects of who he was. I really enjoy that when I read scripture. A lot of us miss out on humanity of Christ as we read scripture. I encourage you to read scripture and begin to understand the personality of Jesus Christ. So here he is in John 12, verse 27. He says this, 
Now my soul is troubled. <clears throat> now that word in the Greek is fascinating to me because it's a word that I think would never describe Jesus. And it's talk about an agitation and unsettledness, something where someone gets up and kind of has to move because they're agitated. The stresses of the moment was upon Jesus in that moment. He said, my soul is troubled. I'm distressed. I'm agitated. I'm unsettled. <clears throat> what can I say? It's what it says in scripture. He says, Father, save me from this hour. There's a couple times that Jesus asked for heaven's intervention at a moment, even on the cross. And yet he understood immediately that <clears throat> he had a full authority. He could do that. But there was something he was called to do that was higher than just being escaping that moment or being redeemed out of that situation. And so he uh, he's in that moment, he's having this agitation, and he says, Father, save me from this hour. And then he says, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. So Jesus has a moment where, boom, he understands his moment. I mean, he wants to escape it. He wants to get out. I'm sure many of you, after a month now of being locked inside, so to speak, you know, you've had these moments where, like, get me out of here. You know, you love your children, but, you know, 24-7 is a little difficult. You love your spouse, but 24-7 could be difficult. You're, you may be wanting to get back to work. You're, you have financial stresses. You have concerns in your life. All those things are pressuring you. It is absolutely human to say, God, get me out of this situation. Free me from this, Lord. You know, uh, save me from this. And yet, yet Jesus has that moment, but then all, all, all of a sudden realizes there's a deeper purpose in this moment that I need to proceed through. So he says, he says, for this purpose, uh, Father, save me. He says, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. That's in verse 27. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. All I can say is Jesus Right answer, <laughs> right answer, Jesus. You you got it. You had that epiphany in a moment. Even Jesus had that. However, you view the humanity and deity of Jesus Christ, he was he was a man fully, but he was a man who was dependent upon God because he was God. He was dependent upon the Father to bring revelation to him and understanding to them. So he had understanding, but I don't, I don't understand. I really don't. But I know this. He was fully human. And he called upon God, even in his distress as he did in this moment. Father, glorify your name. In other words, the right answer was, Lord, show yourself through me. You know, that's the right answer right now in the midst of this pandemic. You know, all your distresses and everything else has come to a place where you say, Lord, it's about you, Lord God. <laughs> May you be glorified in the midst of this. May my children see me walking through this in a Jesus way. May, may my children understand how, what it is to be in the midst of difficulty, not have fear. May they understand what it is to midst of being troubled and yet being joyful. Like it says in James, count it all joy when you encounter these various trials. So we're learning how to move in joy. We're learning how to discern the moment and discern what the purpose of the moment is. He was wrestling in his mind. He's learning excuse me, he's embracing, and now he's confessing it. He's saying, Lord, uh, glorify your name. And then this happens. This is amazing. <laughs> this happens. It says, a voice came from heaven. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I think it's happened to me one time, and it was, it was just about two months ago, actually, where I felt <coughs> the voice of God as I was speaking. It was, it was a very powerful thing. In fact, it, it, it moved me deeply in that moment. So the voice comes from heaven saying, I have been both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now, what is God the Father doing? He's affirming the confession of Jesus Christ. In the midst of the difficulty, the father who, you know, anytime a father sees a son or daughter in distress, it's distressful. I mean, if you're, if you're a good father or a good mother, you, you immediately want to repair this. You want to rescue them. But what you learn in raising children is, is sometimes you shouldn't rescue them. Sometimes the, the greater purpose 
is for you rather than being rescued. Well, sometimes you have to rescue them. When they're very little, of course, if they're in danger in some way, you rescue them. And when they get older, there are times you may have to rescue them. But for the most part, they're growing out of that. They're learning dependency upon the Lord in their own way. And so in this moment, God the Father could have rescued Jesus, but he affirms what Jesus learned in that moment. <laughs> Lord, may you be glorified. And basically God says, it's happening. I'm being glorified and I will be glorified. So this voice from heaven. Now here's the response of people around it. And this, is, this too is... Is interesting to me. But look at verse 29. Therefore, the people who stood by heard it and said that it had thundered. So imagine this right now. God's voice is speaking from heaven. <clears throat> to Jesus, it's very clear. But to others, it sounded like thunder. There was a great book written about 20 years ago. I mentioned earlier, some said it thundered. And it was a reference to the prophetic movement that happened in the late 80s in Kansas City. The people did not understand it. They couldn't discern it. I'm always amazed at how Christians cannot discern moments. Now, I'm not a perfect person. I got to tell you, I get into many moments where I have to, I have to wait on the Lord. I get to clear my mind. I have to settle my, my natural person. Steve, calm down. Steve, focus on Jesus. Get into the purpose of what the Lord's doing. And even in this coronavirus, I, mean, I had moments of, I, I wouldn't say sheer terror. I do that in other times. But in this one, I just thought, wow, we can't meet together physically as a church. What is that going to look like? Um, what about our staff? If finance is going to hold up, what are people going to do? How can we connect with people? All these thoughts going through my mind. I had a moment. And I got such a peace of God that just came upon me. Because I'm learning to discern. I'm becoming a disciple. I'm learning. I'm embracing. Jesus said, learn of me. I'm starting to get it, Jesus. Be patient. When you do, you can feel the voice of God saying, yes, this is the right answer, Steve. It's the right answer. But some hear the thunder. And I want to tell you, everyone outside the walls of wherever you are right now, for the most part, they hear things like thunder. It's, it feels like a threat. It feels scary. It's the voice of God, but they can't discern it. They can't discern this pandemic to know that God is speaking in and through this pandemic. They can't understand that there's something, a purpose for them, an underlying purpose in every challenge that you're facing in your life right now. Be it uh, your marriage, your, your children, your finances, your job, your career, whatever it might be, a discerning disciple of Jesus Christ may not always respond immediately properly, but when they get before the Lord and they settle it in their heart, they may even speak their frustration. I am frustrated like Jesus did. My soul is troubled. But then he came to a moment like the psalmist did all through the book of Psalms where they were distressed in the Lord and all of a sudden, boom, they had this understanding this is my purpose, and I'm going to be okay. And then the confirmation from heaven comes, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Let's read on. It said, some said it thundered, others said an angel had spoken to him. Now think about it. Some heard what they thought was thunder. Others had enough presence to discern that, oh, wait, no, no, that wasn't thunder. That was it was a voice of an angel. You know, they may not have even discerned what it said because it doesn't clarify that right here. They just knew that an angel had spoken to Jesus. I don't know how they knew that. They must have heard a voice coming from above or something. But the point is, is within the group that was around Jesus, the disciples, some were a little keener than others on what was happening in the moment. So it says, some thought it had thundered, Others said an angel had spoken to him, but guess what? Both of them were wrong. Both of these dis groups of disciples were wrong in what they said. It didn't thunder. It wasn't an angel speaking from heaven. It was the Father, God, speaking to them. In that moment, Jesus was the only one that correctly discerned that moment. So out there right now, there's thunder in your life. Something that you cannot discern. You know, there's something like a, a burning bush that's burning and it's not being consumed. It's a mystery. 
And you know, I've taught on this many times. Let me just tell you something right now. Turn into the mystery. Turn into the mystery. Look at the mystery. Study the ministry. Mystery. Bring the mystery before the Lord. We are called to resolve mysteries. We are called to pray that we may interpret. He's calling us in this moment to, to interpret our, our situation. I mean, even in this pandemic, what an amazing practice on interpretation. This is a worldwide meta parable. God is speaking. He is calling us home. He's calling us with our family. You know, the amazing thing is uh, I'm amazed on the Internet. How many people are coming out with the exact same things? I feel God speaking to me. This is a reset. You know, part of me, I mean, in all due respect, it's like, of course it's a reset. Some are saying, you know what? God's calling us into our homes. Of course he's calling us into our homes. I mean, the hand of God is in this and using it in our lives right now. The Lord is causing us to see what's really important. Yes, guess what? You're being prophetic right now. You're discerning. You're not just hearing thunder. There's a lot of people out there who are just hearing thunder. I don't know what's going on. Like children who want to go hide in the closet when there's a thunderstorm. I just call me when it's over. I want to be my, we're near mom and dad. But I want to suck my thumb. I want to have my blanket or whatever. I mean, it's amazing Christians that immediately revert to that. Rather than saying, I am going to discern this moment. I will be a person that sees and understands. I'm be a person that reaches outside of myself and begin to look at what is my purpose. Do you know he is training you? If you yield to him right now, he's training you for a purpose. We have some in our church that have actually responded to this already. I know a lot of people have. I'm hearing it all different places, people that are working and they realize, you know, especially people in the medical community, they understand they're on the front lines. They understand they're there as healers. They're there not only with their physical and intellectual understanding, they have a spirit of God living within them and they're speaking into people's lives. They're seeing people touched. They're mourning with people. They know how to touch the souls of people. They're discerning the moment. They get the purpose. It's not a time just to lay back. It's not a time just to have government give us money while we watch Netflix. This is a time for us to train ourselves for the future when we come out of this pandemic, what kind of believer are you going to be? I, I, I want to submit this to you. I believe that this is that if you will learn from these moments, when you will discern the purpose of what this pandemic means in your life, and maybe for our country, but let's just work on us right now, in your life, when you do that, you will advance forward many years. I always call them dog years, you know, seven for one. You, what would take you seven years in normal life to grow, you could grow in, in one-seventh of that time right now if you yield to the Lord and you give yourself. We have a few testimonies, and then I want to finish up with some keys that I think will help you out. But a few testimonies here real quick of what's happening with people in our church as they're reaching out. Well, I'm here with Christopher Milo and Kim Snyder. And we're gonna talk about what we can do to make a difference. A lot of times in the midst of this crisis, people are focused on the things we can't do. In this segment, we wanna talk about what we can do. So in many ways, leadership, one of the best definitions of leadership is that leadership is problem solving. And so there's a big problem out there, but God's people are called to be problem solvers. And we've gotta ask this question, what does love require of me? What can I do to help? So Kim, when, as you've had these interactions, what's another way that you've seen God just, um, you know, surprise someone with the specifics? That's right. Um, we delivered to a gentleman that um, just had open heart surgery. And uh, so he couldn't go out and he was an elderly gentleman as well. And so I got his grocery list because he was refer referral right to me. And then when he was done, I said, um, what's your favorite candy? And he's like, really? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. And so he's like, greasy peanut butter cup. I'm like, woohoo, mine too. And so he was stunned that we cared enough. That we met the need, but what do you want? Let us just treat you, you know, just humanity. And so um, Christopher did the shopping for this gentleman. 
and got him a stack of Reese peanut butter cups. It was amazing. You, you would have thought he won the lottery. Absolutely, yeah. Reese peanut butter cups. Mm -hmm. Because we said, what do you want? Not just what do you need, you know? And then the people that had the children, we made sure we got treats in there for all of the awesome. children. And we also handed out books too, um, from Literacy, yeah, in, Literacy the Hood, in the Hood. Yeah. Donated 200 books um, for us to hand out in the city. So we made sure we gave books to all the kids too. Christopher, tell me, you told me earlier a story about carrying a, a case of water up to a front door. Tell me that story. Yeah, we, uh, I was walking up to the house, I had a bag of groceries in this hand and the case of water on my shoulder. And the mom, 67 years old, looked at the daughter and I could hear her say, is that bottled water? And I, I remember getting emotional just because I take that for granted, you know, and I, I sat it down in front of her, you know, trying to keep the whole social distance. And she looked me dead in the eyes and she goes, God bless you. And it's like, it's just water. Yeah. But to some people, we don't know what a big deal means to them. We have two, two duties, and that's to serve and love people. And, and that's, that's what we've been trying to do. And, and that's what's in our control. You know, we're like most people where we don't have jobs and we don't have income right now. But wait, 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 say that again. You're like most people who don't have jobs and we don't have an income. But yet you still ask the question. What do you need? What do you need? Mm -hmm. You had two fish and five loaves. Sure. And because of those two fish and five loaves, God has been using people right. to multiply and meet those needs. But he didn't just use people. He, he sent us almost $3,500 in three days because of the body. People responded, but I've learned that you can't get something if you don't ask. Yeah. So we asked for it and, and people started to help and you know, the people are still inquiring. They still want to help. The need isn't going away. Right. We still need help. But what's awesome about what it is that we're doing, like Kim was sharing, it's, I forget the brand of lunch meat that's at Giant Eagle. They asked for this type of ham. We went to Giant Eagle and got that, a pound of that ham. It wasn't just ham, it was that ham. It was, th this is the brand that they wanted. And we're blessing people with exactly what they asked for, not what we think somebody should have. So if you would like to help financially or help by volunteering, please text the number on the screen and you also can be a difference maker and help meet that need in a tremendous way. And I promise you, every one of these acts of kindness will ultimately cause people to see God in a more clear and powerful way. Wow, what a powerful testimony about people that are reaching out, Christopher, Kim, and many others that are going out to feed those that are really hurting right now, cannot get go out to get groceries. I know from what I see on social media and those I've talked to, there are scores of you that are doing these kinds of things. And I commend that. Those are people that are not just hearing thunder, they're hearing clarity, they're hearing the purpose of God in their life. They're understanding and when you do that, I mean, this is proven over and over in scripture. When you yield yourself, especially to the poor and broken, it says in Isaiah 58, it has reciprocity attached to it. It's sowing and reaping. And when you sow into them, it's amazing what it brings back into your own life as you yield to him. You know, I was trained early on as a, a business trainer. This is back in um, 1986. I just happened onto it. Long story short, I became trained in a worldwide uh, course that trains business people in about nine different courses. I eventually was trained in three of the courses. <clears throat> I taught hundreds and hundreds of people over the uh, nine-year period in Canada. And I learned so much about business, about people, and about you know, just human relations with people. But in it, my goal, like what I was trained to do was to, to look at somebody and speak, see, see the good that was in that. 
I mean, it was so powerful every week, uh, 44 times in the first part, for, so about 88 times per session, I had to speak into an individual's life in front of a group of people and tell them what I saw in them, two times for every person, 88 times. I mean, it became so crazy because after about 10 times, you don't know what to say. In fact, sometimes you don't even know these people well. So what happens is the Holy Spirit kicks in. You prophetically begin to see what is good in people. You begin to see what is going on in their circumstances that they can't see. A lot of people out there that I talk to, they're just hearing thunder. They're feeling threatened, you know, by their marriage. They're feeling threatened by being bullied at school. They feel threatened by these things. They're, they're not able to see God is in the midst of it. I don't think God's bringing the bullying to you. But he's going to use it to train you. And when you yield yourself and discover that, amazing things happen. So I spent nine years training people, look, how to grow under pressure, how to speak in the opposite spirit. I actually confess, so there's a, I think it's a Geico commercial on right now. And it's kind of funny to me. It may not be funny to everyone else, but it has Pinocchio in it. And you know, Pinocchio is famous for when he lies, his nose grows. And in this particular commercial, he's a, he's a motivational speaker. And he points to a guy in the front row and starts to, you know, say these good things over him. And the guy's sitting there looking at him. And as he's speaking these things, his nose is growing. It's like he's lying. Well, you know, I get that. I think it's kind of funny, you know. But he was, he's actually speaking truth. Motivational speakers, their, their desire, whether they're successful or not, is to look into somebody in all the difficulty and all the trash that's been brought into their lives. They may be under a mountain of trash, but somehow a discerning spirit can look into it because they are hearing from God. All that person is saying, man, <clears throat> I'm just hearing thunder. I'm feeling threatened. I have no clarity at all. Maybe they have a little bit more clarity. They're saying, I'm hearing something, but I don't know what it is, like an angel from heaven. I'm hearing something, but it's not clear. They need prophetic people to emerge out of this captivity, out of this pan pandemic and say, you know what? I've got clarity for you. And as soon as you hear someone talking about their stuff, this thundering that's going on in their life, you know, some people, I don't know why, but they're afraid to speak up in these situations. Jesus called us to speak into those situations and can say something like this, say, can I just tell you something that I sense from what you're saying? People are looking for clarity. They're looking for interpreters. They're looking for someone who will step up in the midst of their difficulty and bring definition to it, bring help to them of how to get out of this thing. So you speak in it and say, you're going to get through this. You're going to come on the other side. You're going to grow under this pressure. It's because some people will not be rescued out of their situation. And you need to discern that. You need to say, you know, I don't know if you're going to be rescued out of this, but I do know this. You will go through this all the way and you will come out on the other side, solid gold. You say, well, I don't know that. Well, you know, that's the intention of heaven. You know, that's the purpose of God. Prophesy it into their lives. Give them a roadway for them to run on. Speak something powerful that can shape their life. If you don't know what else to say, somehow use the name of Jesus. It is powerful and it'll work into their lives. I saw it happen for nine years in business and I've seen it happen for over 40 years in ministry. You gotta get people to stop worrying and to start living. I mean, I was trained in that. I remember the story of a man that I read about in a Dale Carnegie book that was so distressed. He was dying. His, his, his stress was physically killing him. And the doctor said, <clears throat> you'll be dead in six months. This is like 100 years ago. He said, you'll be dead in six months. You might as well enjoy whatever time you have left. So this guy, he sells all of his possessions. He buys a casket and he buys a world a cruise uh, uh, line uh, ticket uh, to go all the way around the world, which was like a 100-day uh, ticket or something like that. This is 100 years ago. And they were, they were questioned, first of all, why are you putting, want to take this casket? And he says, well, I'm probably going to die on this trip. So um, I want to take the casket with me. Wherever I am, you can just have me buried and I'll leave money for it. He said, okay, well, I've never had that happen before. So this guy gets on there and he has a great time. He meets new friends. He's having great meals every day. He's seeing the world. By the end of the trip, he gets off and he's totally healed. Now, I always remember that story because I thought, it's, it's about geography of your mind. It's about geography of your soul. 
if you can shift, that man shifted his physical body into a different reality out of the things that were causing him stress into another place. Do you understand that you can bring definition from the thunder, from the death, from the hurt that's coming in your life? You can shift into another place where clarity comes. And when clarity begins to come, you begin to heal. And guess what? You become a different person. I remember in 2015, we faced a, <clears throat> a major trial of the church. Actually, it was my responsibility as president of the organization, the nonprofit. Uh, the bank was coming after us and wanted us to pay off our loan. There's a long story why it happened. And it's not totally their fault. It's not totally our fault. It, it was just a, it should have been overlooked and it wasn't. But anyway, they came after us. They met with me and said, Pastor Witt, you have 90 days to come up with $1.5 million. <laughs> I don't know what we had at the time, 500 people, something like that. I mean, <clears throat> I know that when I, even as I share this, people go, well, just believe God, you know? But that wasn't my first response. Our first response was like, O-M-G. What are we going to do in this situation? I mean, I didn't sleep for nights. And I started reading a book. A friend of mine gave me a book, not knowing what I was going through. And it was a kind of a motivational book, Christian motivational book by Andy Andrews. And I'll just tell you this, on the cover of it, it showed a ring of keys with five kind of old skeleton type keys. And obviously he had these five keys he was going to give you in the book. <clears throat> but the funny thing is everywhere I went, keys began to be a little bit of a theme, you know, it was really weird. And so I'm, I'm calling all these banks one after another. They're turning me down. Banks are saying, we don't deal with churches. Banks are saying, you know, we need to have coffee first. And like, I'm going, well, I don't have time for coffee. I need $1.5 million in 90 days. You know, so I'm, I'm distressed. I'm, I relate well with this moment of Jesus where he was distressed and troubled in his heart, you know. And, it, and I, I'm trying to yield. I'm trying to cast my cares upon the Lord. But boy, it just, boom, it kept coming right back in my face. I don't know if that's happened with you, but it was happening to me. $1.5 million must be my my point of distress because it hit me big. It wasn't my 1.5 million, you know, it's the Lord's church. But in that moment, I felt the responsibility for it. And so I was sat there one day distressed and I, I looked over at a picture that someone in our church painted of Jacob receiving the, the ladder dream, you know, where he, the angels were ascending and descending and the Lord just spoke to me. And he said, call the banker that you know and see if she can help you out. And this is a banker I'd been dealing with for years. Commercial banker, I called her up and she said, oh, I don't know, I might be able to help you, but are you aware I'm not at the bank that I was at before? And I said, no. I said, where, where are you? And she said, I'm with Key Bank. Now this whole key thing, this key parable I've been running in my life. So I'm in a thunder zone right now. I do not have clarity. I do not have release. I'm troubled in my spirit. I'm working my way through the process. Um, I'm doing my due diligence, but boy, this is distressful, you know. And she says, let's meet and I'll talk to you about it. Anyway, she got on it. We we kind of hired her to do it. And she got on this thing and, and you know, it did bring a certain level of relief. She said, I think I can take care of this. But boy, the bank was calling me, the other bank. There, there was pressure. There was distress. There was... I mean, it was, it was constant. They were saying, you know, you got so many days left. How are you doing? Like they're, I could feel it. You know, they're like Nehemiah and Tobiah and Sambalat, you know, if a fox runs upon this wall, it will collapse. And they told me there'd be great penalties that would come upon me. And it was, it was difficult. But everywhere I went, I was seeing keys. During that time, I had to go out to Redding, California. I go into a Hampton Inn, they give me a key. And it says, uh, new doors are opening. And this key, I put it in there and it opens the door, of course. And, and the Lord's just showing me keys, keys, keys. I go to the conference where there was about, it was a side uh, deal where we were meeting with Bill Johnson. It was about 40 of us from around the world up on a mountain. I sit down and around the table are these skeleton keys like I saw on the book. The key that is also in the key bank logo, the same key was sitting in front of me and I noticed it was in front of everyone. I said, what's this? And they said, oh, Benny Johnson had this prophetic idea that there, this was the time of keys and laid a key out in front of everyone. And I said, can I keep this? They said, oh yeah, it's a gift for everyone who came. I still had that key actually, I picked it up. 
Later on, I went to Cali uh, Southern California or Mid-Coast California, and I was preaching. And I was just talking about this key thing. A lady runs home, comes back to the second service, and gives me this big ring of keys that she had. She said she tried to break off one key to bring to me, could not break it, so she brought me. It was a big, heavy thing with these big, long keys on it. And she said, here, you could keep this. The second service, I preached with those keys in my hand. I called people up that said, Do you, this is while I'm under the pressure. I'm getting clarity out of the thunder into the understanding of where God wants to take me. I prayed for people that morning. I literally laid the keys on their shoulders. People who were bound up and could not get out of their situation. There was no clarity at all. I said, Lord, open the doors. And I put the keys on them. The power of God was hitting these people. They were getting answers from the Lord. And guess what? I was getting an answer too. Piece by piece, the Lord was bringing his peace into my life. Hearing his voice is such an amazing thing in any person's life. It brings immediate understanding as God affirms the purpose that he's called you to. There's a purpose in this. There's a purpose in what you're going through. By the way, the end of that story is we had to have money paid by May 15th. May 15th was the deadline at midnight. May 15th at noon, the banker came in. The, the banker who was helping us out sat down. She said, I got good news for you. They gave me everything that I asked for. And she, in fact, she told me, what kind of an agreement do you want? And I told her in detail what kind of agreement I wanted. And she had it all put out there. She said, we're able to do pretty much everything that you asked for. All you have to do is sign right here. Of course, you know how it is. We signed like 30 pages or something like that. And boom, she said, I'm going to have great joy calling the bank, the other bank, and telling them this is done. It is finished. I mean, I cannot tell you the weight that came off of my shoulders in that moment. Really, I didn't have to walk through that way, but hey, I'm still learning. I'm a, I'm a Jesus follower, you know. I'm, I'm learning of him. I'm a disciple. I tell you, I've had other situations since then. In fact, many great situations I've had to deal with. I remember that because that becomes a benchmark. It becomes a battle cry in my heart. And I realize, no, 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 no. I walk through that difficult situation and I'm going to walk through this situation different. I'm going to be in the mode of a learner. I'm a disciple. I'm following Jesus Christ. Whatever this pandemic is about, and I have indications, it's about me. It's about you. It's about us drawing back to the simplicity of life. It's about us coming into a new relationship with the Lord. He's calling us in to look into his word again, start praying regularly again to change our lives. We have the opportunity of coming out of this pandemic a different person with a different headline over our life. We have the opportunity to come from a place, a person of thunder that you never hear clearly from the Lord. Everything that happens is a threat. Did you know that is not the intention of God for you? In this threat, in this difficulty, in this trial, in this tribulation, the Lord has designed this, purposed this, for you to become something different in him. Grab a hold of that right now and see what the Lord has for you. I love that verse. I've got it up here in my notes somewhere. But uh, in Hebrews, there's a couple of really good verses, and I'll close with this. In Hebrews chapter 5, it says that Jesus, now imagine this, Jesus, it says, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Let me just tell you the word there is trained. He was trained in obedience by the things which he suffered. Even Jesus, incarnation, son of God, learned obedience through the things which he suffered. In other words, in the suffering, he was like, hmm, I know what I need to do. I need to obey. I really do think during this coronavirus, we need to bring it very personal. In fact, the whole Second Chronicles passage, if my people will, uh, who call upon my name will, I'll show you what is it, if they will humble themselves and pray. And I, I'm humbling myself right now before the Lord and saying, Lord Jesus, what is this speaking into my heart? Lord, what, what are you wanting to transfer out of my heart? What are you wanting to bring into my heart? This is the moment right now. If Jesus did that, I will do that. And it says he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, 
he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. What a powerful thing that there is something that God wants to take us into. I'm hesitant to use the word perfected, but there's a better Steve that's going to come out on the other side of this. It also says in Hebrews chapter 12, it said that, that in verse 11, it says, chastening seems to be not to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful, peaceable fruit of righteousness to who? Those who have been trained by it. So let me tell you how this virus originated in one sense is not important to me. In another sense, it is. But in one sense, it's not. The virus is here, and this has become a chastening of the Lord for the church. Can we not take a moment and look at our lives and say, Lord, there's things that need to change, and I will be trained during this period of time that they will notice the difference at work, they will notice the difference in my home, they will notice the difference in my neighborhood, because I have become a disciple and learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just kind of, let's just wait in the presence of the Lord for a minute. I want to minister to a few people as I close up. And this is a powerful time. You know, it says in the Bible in Romans that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, which we, we remembered and celebrated last week, the Bible says you will be saved. Right now, there's people watching this. I know this goes out to thousands of people after I speak it. It will turn over and over in YouTube and on our webpage and on Facebook. And so I'm speaking to people, even though it might be Tuesday when you watch this or Wednesday or whatever, this is not an accident that you're watching this. And right now in your distress, you say, you know, I, I've got a lot of confusion. I've, that's the thunder. I've got a lot of fogginess, fuzziness. In my, that's thunder. God has something better for you. He has clarity for you. Mystery is great. God loves mystery. But mystery is all to bring you into mastery and clarity. And so we call you right now into clarity. What is clarity in your life right now? Give your life to Jesus Christ right now in this moment. He designed you to be in this moment. And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, <clears throat> you will be saved. And so right now in this moment, right now, just, no, just repeat this after me. Just say, Father God, I come before you. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for me and was raised up. And I receive resurrection power into my life. Jesus, raise me up, resurrect me into newness of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, you may have been raised Methodist, Presbyterian, but you've drifted far from God. It's not about religion. It's not about how well you even know the Bible. It's about the knowledge of God, Jesus Christ himself. You yield to him. You know he's the way. And he's going to take care of all that. And you're going to be on a fresh start right now. If you prayed that with me right now out there, if you had drifted away from the Lord, you've come back, but you prayed that, I would ask you to do something right now. Text your name and email to this number because we'd love to respond to you. We'd love to pray for you. We also have a video course free of charge, a video course that you can get access to and watch it. It's going to give you more teaching about these kinds of things. 216-279-8338. I think it's on your screen right now. 216-279-8338. Text your name and email. And we'll get back with you. We'll pray with you. We'll help you in your new walk in Jesus Christ. God bless you, Bethel Cleveland, and God bless you, all those who have been visiting us from all around the world during this strange time, this, this pandemic that we're going to. We love you any way we can help you, even if you're living in Turkey or New Zealand or Bali or wherever you might be. We speak right now the presence and power of God upon you, and I want to confess to you right now, you will get through this. Clarity will come into your mind, and even though some say it thundered, some heard an angel, you're going to hear the Father speak in your life, and he's going to confirm what he's called you to do, and you're going to come out in the fire of God. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you very much.